Heavenly Father, Holy God in heaven, God of grace and of mercy, God of power, and the very God who is holy. We thank you for being holy. We thank you for, by your Holy Spirit, speaking to us loudly, even in worship songs or in your spoken word. God, we thank you that your holy word is necessary for us, good for us, even when it's hard for us. And God, we thank you that you make us holy by your your son Christ, who once and for all paid the debt that we never could. So God, we thank you for being powerful. We thank you for being merciful and graceful and for being holy. And now, God, I pray that you will meet us in our own brokenness, in the midst of our own chaos of life, in the thousands of things that could be running through our mind. Will you please help us be still, help us be attentive, and help us hear what it is that you want us to hear. Use this broken servant to communicate what is pure and perfect from your word. And Lord, may we leave this place more encouraged because we know that you are a God who speaks. Even when you feel far, Lord, thank you for being a God who is never absent. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I want you to imagine for one moment that it is a glorious day in the fall. The weather is perfect. You decide to pack up the kids, maybe the niece and the nephew. You get into the car. You're going to go apple picking. You're going to find an apple orchard and go grab some delicious apples. And upon arriving to the apple orchard, you see the branches of the trees nearly bending over because of the massive amounts of apples and fruit that are now on their branches. Imagine that you get there and your kids burst out of the car so excited. Dad, look at all the apples. Mom, I can't believe these apples. So they grab their bags or their baskets and they run off and they start picking the apples from the orchard. As you're there harvesting this beautiful fruit, one of the workers on the farm comes up to you and said, you came at the perfect time. These apples are amazing. We haven't seen a harvest like this in years. The farmer goes on to explain that last year, in the spring, maybe around this time of the year, there was this late frost that came in and, and it froze all the trees. All the little nodules on the branches froze. These nodules are called scions. These little scions on the apple tree branches froze and, and that late frost caused for that year's harvest to be absolutely miserable. But this year's different. Because of the late frost last year, all of that energy was kept in those scions. And the farmer starts explaining to you how this works scientifically, that now all this energy that is built up for over a year's time is now bursting forth with this profusion of buds and the unbelievable amounts of fruit. Last year's harvest was miserable, this farm worker says to you. But this year's harvest is remarkable. Sometimes our lives feel just like that. We have a late frost that comes in, illness that strikes us, marriage struggles we never expected, a job loss, the death of a loved one, We're not able to make the bills, money problems after money problems in this frost seems to come upon our life, making us feel like we've been abandoned or we're out in the cold. All of the plans that we had suddenly seem to be put on hold, if not demolished altogether, because this, this cold season spiritually and emotionally and circumstantially has now crept into our life. And we cry out to God in the midst of the late frost and we say, God, where are you? Have you ever felt like God is silent? Those frostbitten times in life lead us to think that nothing is happening. Those late frosts in life make us feel like we've been frozen out. But the truth is, something is happening. God is powerful and he's creating and storing up energy in the hidden places. I call these the scions of our soul. God is always doing something. 
And in the seasons of silence, we can feel like our hearts are waiting, that they're longing. Would you please just show up in some way, even aching? And it feels like all of the little hopeful pieces of our life have been frozen off. And we question where to find hope. We question what will come in the future. As a Christian, we know that our hope is found believing that at some point, all of this pent up energy, all of the potential that we had before the suffering came in will somehow be unleashed into a joyful life, into something that our hearts crave that are greater than the circumstances we experience. Today, I wanna talk about the moments of silent scions in our life. As we continue this series entitled, The Best is Yet to Come. I wanna talk about the moments where it does feel like we've been frozen out or even abandoned by the great farmer, the great harvester, the great gardener of our life, God himself. Nobody felt that more than Naomi in the book of Ruth, at least from my perspective, as I read the Old Testament, here's a woman who had to grapple with the reality of the frosty feeling of God's love that at times came through discipline or change or loss. And throughout the entire book of Ruth, we continue to see her struggle with God. What are you doing? And how do I make sense of this? All the while, he's storing something up in the scions of her life that bring forth a great harvest come chapter four of this tiny little book. I want to look at the book of Ruth today and I want, you to help, I want to help you recognize that there will be seasons of silence in your life. There will be seasons where God seems to have hit the mute button and he's not speaking. But the truth is he's always active and he's always present and he's always moving. I've entitled my message today, God may be quiet, but he is never absent. Certainly there has been some point in your life where you have felt God is not being as loud as he should be, not as clear as he should be. You've longed for the Excel spreadsheet to give you all the numbers to show you how it's going to play out, or at least for him to act like the GPS on your phone that tells you rerouting, rerouting, or turn here, but he doesn't. God may be silent, but he's never absent. You don't have to take my word for it. Open up your Bibles with me to the book of Ruth. We're going to look at chapter 1, verses 1 through 6 today. It's found on page 222 in the Bibles in front of you. You can follow along with my outline on the Grace Chapel app or on the back of your bulletin. I want you to be note-taking people, so please write these notes down as we go through this passage. And if at any time you have a question about the text that I'm looking at today, or the subject we talk about, you can text the number on the screen or the number on the back of your bulletin, and I might do my best to address those in the weeks to come. But join me as we encounter God through his written word. Today, we'll look at the first six, should I, should I say, tragic verses of the book of Ruth. And we're going to identify reasons why God can feel silent and what our faith reaction should be to those seasons. Let's look at verse one, Ruth chapter one, it says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Now, let's pause there for a second. We talked last week in our overview sermon of the book of Ruth that this was at the time of the judges. This book was written over a 30-year period of time that existed while, uh, that happened while the judges existed in Israel. So while judges are ruling the people, the Israelites, this story is happening. Now, the season of the judges was marked by a season of great disobedience. The people were not obeying God. And so therefore, they had to be disciplined for their disobedience. God allowed their enemies to win over them. He allowed natural disasters to come in, all as a way to discipline them for their disobedience. In this case, he allowed a famine, which was a way to discipline them for not trusting him as the one true God. So keep going with verse one. It says, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So they're experiencing this famine, presumably because of the Israelites' disobedience to the Lord. Now, it says this man from Bethlehem, this man from Bethlehem. What else happened in Bethlehem? What significant happened in Bethlehem? Anything else happened? 
What I hear? Jesus was born. Christmas, right? I heard Christmas. All right. Yes, you're absolutely right. You're good Bible students. Yes. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, right? You're like, was that Bethlehem? Was that Nazareth? No, no, it was totally Bethlehem. That's where he was born. And he came. So this is hundreds of years before that in Bethlehem. Here is this man who sojourns in Moab. The word sojourn means to take a temporary stay. He never intended for this to be something that he did long term. He simply went away from the land of Israel, the promised land of God, and he he went into this place to find food, presumably trying to avoid the discipline of God. So the discipline of God was that they didn't have food or water. He, He didn't want to stay under the discipline of God, so he moved out from underneath it to Moab. Okay, that's like my daughter in the car last night who after wailing on her sister, hitting her repeatedly, I said, all right, now you're going to have to have a discipline, right? So when we stop the car, it means there's going to be a discipline to which she proceeds to hide behind the seats in the back of the car as if I'm going to be like, well, where'd she go, right? I guess she just flew out along the way, right? I guess that means no discipline, right? She's avoiding the discipline of God. In the same way, it seems that this man and his family are trying to get away from the discipline of God. Rather than being a voice of repentance, saying, let's turn this thing around, let's get back on track with the Lord, they move to Moab. So they go to the land of Moab, which is an unclean land. The chosen land was Cana, or the promised land, they move to this unclean land of Moab. And ironically, they leave Bethlehem, which Bethlehem actually means the house of bread. You see the irony there? They're leaving the house of bread because there is no bread to go find bread in Moab, to walk away from God, to walk away from his discipline. But unwittingly, and should I say unwisely, they're also walking away from God's protection and God's favor in their life. Verse 2 picks it up. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of their two sons were Milan and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from, the Beth- from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. If we were to look at a map of Israel and Moab, you'd see that they're very close together. Remember, Israel is very small. It's only the size of New Jersey. You can fit 13 Israels inside the state of Colorado, okay? So it's a very small piece of land. But Israel is here. I've cut down just to the bottom of it. They were living in Cana, God's promised land. They're one of the tribes living in Cana. They moved from Cana to Moab. Moab is directly across the Dead Sea and across the Jordan Valley. We can look at this and say, well, if they move moved due east across this little plot of land, okay? Small little move geographically. They move uh, horizontally across the map. They move to a place that has the same altitude as the land that they were dwelling in, but now has completely different circumstances. It's not in a famine. Moab had plenty of water. We could say, wow, if they're that close together, then perhaps it is true that the famine was localized to the people of Israel as an act of discipline. He had chosen this little tiny part to be the place he was firm with and took away water from and food from, but he didn't over here. These are God's chosen people. These are God's people rebelling against him. So what did they do? Let's leave the promises. Let's leave the provision. Let's leave the discipline of God and move away. I'm pretty certain that Elimelech and Naomi and their sons had to feel a little bit of frustration with God. They probably thought he was cruel at worst and that he was distant at best. They would have known that the people of Israel were walking in disobedience. They probably would have even understood that God had to do something. But God's doing something wasn't what they wanted. They didn't want God's discipline. He's a loving and good father, yes, but he also corrects his children. Believe me, I've learned this the hard way. He corrects his children, and when we're in a moment of disobedience, it can feel like God is silent. If you're taking notes, write that down. God can seem silent when we are being disciplined for disobedience. 
Now, God is not actually silent when he's disciplining you. In fact, he's very near to you. He's disciplining you. He's showing you love, but not in the way that maybe you want to be loved. You'd rather him be the warm, cozy blanket that you throw over you when the frost comes rather than to be the very one who brought the frost or who brought the cold. We don't like to think of God as a disciplining God, but he does abhor, he comes against, he's all against disobedience. Now, ultimately, he had his son pay the price for our disobedience, but he still disciplines. And when he disciplines, we can say, why is he being so silent? We like to downplay his discipline and we like to overplay his comfort. D.A. Carson an author I read a lot of, a great theologian, he wrote in a book, The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. He wrote this. He said, the love of God in our culture has been purged of anything that culture finds uncomfortable. True statement. The love of God has been sanitized. The love of God has been democratized. Let's all say that together because I can't, right? <laughs> Democratized. It has been sentimentalized. We scrub the love of God. We scrub it clean because we don't want to think that he would discipline us or come against us in our disobedience. We just want him to be loving and like some good grandfather who loves us and gives us nothing but gifts and love and never disciplines us. Yeah, we've all been around the kid who never gets disciplined. You know that kid, right? Think about that kid. You know that kid. Who the parents are convinced that their kid can don't do no wrong. He does something that's totally wrong and they go, oh, isn't that so cute? And you're like, no, it's actually not cute. He should not do that. And we get frustrated when these little snotty-nosed kids get off the hook for doing whatever they think is right because their parents are fearful of teaching them hard lessons. And so they therefore choose to insulate them from consequences. And we're bothered deep down because we realize that's not loving. You letting your kid get away with everything is not loving. If you don't teach your kid the cause and effects of life, then they're going to be taught it more harshly later on. So it's, it's not loving for you to just let your kid always get off the hook. And we, we can think about that with other parents. Of course, we would never do that with our own kids, but we can think about that with other parents and go, why are they being so unloving? Yet the same thing is true with God in the sense that he's a loving father who we want to just let us off the hook for things, but but it's so loving of him when he comes in and he disciplines us and he deals with our disobedience justly. And yes, he has compassion and yes, he has love and yes, he has grace and mercy found in the cross of Jesus Christ. But he has to uphold both grace and mercy and justice and wrath. And so he upholds both of these things in our life and it, it, it results in us being disciplined, disciplined for disobedience. And while we are cleansed by the cross, I'm not downplaying the power of the cross, he still allows us to walk through consequences. Believe me, I know. And there will be times where it feels like he's being quiet as we work through our sin and as we work towards repentance. But I promise you, he's never absent. In the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 12, there's great verses starting around verse four and five about the discipline of the Lord. But at verse 11, the Hebrew, Hebrews writer reminds us that God's love is also played out through discipline when he writes, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. At the moment when we're under discipline, we can't think of anything more painful. God, where are you? And why the freeze? Aren't you going to do something to stop all this? 
It feels painful more than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of the righteousness to those who have been trained by it. This is the scions of the soul. This is how he works all things together for his glory and for our good. So while we may perceive him to be silent in the midst of discipline, he is not absent. He's not. He's working. He's working. And not only were Elimelech and Naomi experiencing God's discipline through famine, through having to wander in the deserts of Moab, but they had to be feeling that God was moving away from them as they experienced change and unfamiliarity. They wandered in the desert, the hot deserts. I've wandered in the hot deserts of Israel in October, one of the hottest Octobers in the history of Israel. I was there. I walked it. Some of you were there with me. Imagine that. They're going through that. Nothing's familiar. They're leaving what they know to be familiar. Now change is setting in. So disappointment over discipline, disappointment over all sorts of things. But now their circumstances are changing and they had to be asking, God, where are you? And God, why are you not showing up? It's true for all of us that when we experience change, that God can seem silent. When we go through seasons of change, God can seem silent. These seasons are particularly hard when we're the kind of people who long for safety and security. Small changes are hard for some people. Big changes literally level some people. It feels too, too dramatic for them, too downright daunting for them to get over. A job transfer from one city to the next that can seem unbearable. The ups and downs of the financial market, like this week, can be more than someone can bear. If you're a person who longs for safety and security, then man, when a cherished friend moves away, you, you can't get past the pain. Or when you're when your circumstances change as a parent and all of a sudden the, the kids you thought you control or at least pull in. Now you can't. Change can level you. Your elderly parents get put into a nursing home and are no longer self-sufficient. These things can be too much for some. I think some of us have consistency as an idol of our heart. We love consistency more than we love Christ. And if change comes We'll go with it as long as it's on our terms or for our favor. But the truth be told, if we have consistency too high in our heart, we will get frustrated and we will wonder why someone, why God had to upset the apple cart. However, I've learned that sometimes change is the very thing that produces the greatest progress in life. Sometimes things have to change. Relationships have to change. Circumstances have to change in order for there to be progress. And he peels our little white knuckles off of all the things that we replace with him. And he puts himself in our hands and he redirects us to cling to him all the more. Cling to me. It's not about what you have in your life. Cling to me. That's what he wants. So while he may seem silent in seasons of change, he's calling you all the closer. This was certainly true for Naomi. Naomi had seasons of discipline in her life. She had seasons of change in her life, but she also experienced deep seasons of loss in her, in her life. Look at verse three. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives, the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Milan and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. This doesn't seem fair, does it? Why would a loving God allow a famine? Why would he have a move across the border? Why the death of a husband? Why the death of two sons? Certainly that doesn't seem like a loving God. And it certainly doesn't seem to portray that he's in control of her circumstances. For sure, for her, she had to feel like life was out of control. Because if God really loved people, specifically Naomi, why would he allow all of this to happen? A 
a mind that is not thinking God's way. We'll look at all that's happening in Naomi's life and say, well, God shouldn't have expected Elimelech to live in a land with his wife and kids where they would starve. That's not loving of God. The earthly mind, the human mind might say, well, it's not fair that God would kill Elimelech for being disobedient. It's not fair that God would have the two sons, Milan and Chilion, live in Moab and not have someone to love on. It's not fair that he would expect them not to get married to a Moabite woman and then take their life for them. Yeah, you're right. By human terms, none of this seems fair. But listen to me, look up here. God allows suffering in our life to awaken us spiritually. The discipline of God is a way that God is calling us to come closer to him. He's allowing his glory to be seen. He's working things together so his purposes may be fulfilled. This is true in the Old Testament, but it's also true in the New Testament. That even post the cross of Christ, God will sovereignly allow us to experience circumstances that produce in us Christ-likeness. And there is no other way but that way to produce the likeness of Christ in you. It doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair at all. And there will be moments in our trials and in our suffering and in our pain and even as consequences of our sin, where we say, God, why can't this just stop? Stop it, please. I've been there. I get it. But in the scions of our soul, he freezes some things and holds some things and causes death to some things in order to produce something greater in the future that you have no idea of. And all of that is in the category of making you more like Christ. So God can seem distant in discipline. God can seem distant in the midst of change, but God can also seem distant in silence when we go through seasons of loss. And in the face of loss, we will often scream, it's not fair, God. These seasons of loss can include somebody you love being taken from you. It could be the moment that somebody comes in, a husband to a wife, a wife to a husband, throws the papers across the table and says, I'm ready for a divorce. It can be when a friend, a friend, who you trusted betrayed you. It can be when a serious diagnosis is given to you. These losses, they come without warning. They're furious squalls that crash upon our life right when we least expect it. And all of a sudden, the things that were consistent or seemed normal now seem meaningless. And in these seasons, we can shake our fist at God and we can ask all of our why questions and rightly so in some instances. We can't make sense of loss. And when we can't make sense of loss, we don't know who to blame. And so sometimes we look to God and say, why are you sitting silent in the corner and not doing something? Do something. And when he doesn't respond with the answer that we want, or he doesn't respond as promptly as we want, our anger begins to boil over. In these moments, all of our prayers turn to sentences that end with exclamation marks and periods. And if you find yourself in one of those seasons right now or in the future, I say you have to change your punctuation. Maybe it's not time for you just to yell at God and tell him all the things he's done wrong, exclamation mark and period. Maybe it's time for you to ask some questions like Moses or Abraham or Isaiah or Joshua or King David. They would burst into God's throne room and they would ask him questions like Psalm 13, verse one. How long, O Lord? Question mark. Will you forget me forever? Question mark. How long will you hide your face from me? 
Question mark. The raw prayers that we see in the Psalms specifically and elsewhere are pleas for God to not be silent, but they're not just saying these statements with some kind of haphazard question mark at the end as if to really say a statement, but actually be asking a question. No, I believe they're actually asking a question. Are you going to do something? Are you going to intervene? And, and if it's not how I perceive that you should, then God, will you just show me your face? Will you help me trust you in the midst of what doesn't make sense? God eventually does what is best for his kingdom. God always does what is best for his kingdom. We know that in Romans 8, 28. And that means that it is working together for our good, but it does not mean that it always comes without pain or waiting. He's working things together. And during Naomi's loss, she's experiencing incredible disappointment with God. But at some point, she had to get back up. The, the sun still rose. The next day still came. She had to get back up. She had to put one foot in front of the other and keep on moving. But I think it was the goodness of God that was calling her to get up. It was the goodness of God that was calling her to come back. Look at verse 6. It says, then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. When our eyes are opened to God's activity, his blessing and his care and his love, when our eyes are open to these things, we finally get to the point where we leave the mess, the mess of our emotions and the mess of our disappointment. We drop it and we return to him in trust. The Lord was near to his people. The famine had ended. She heard about it as she's in the fields of Moab. Naomi had waited for God to do something in her situation. Breakthrough, please. He wasn't. But then she hears that he's moving in his people back in Israel. So she finally got up and she headed back to where God was moving. We can learn something from this. Waiting on God is a call to trust him, yes, but it also means we have to move ourselves back onto his agenda. He never left the Israelites. He disciplined the Israelites, but he never left them. And so now she gets back up and she starts to move back to this place where she hears that God is moving. Had God clearly spoken to her? No, she heard about some circumstantial changes. She pieced things together and realized that God's working. I've learned that God can also seem silent when he's moving us to just trust him more. God was moving Naomi to trust him more, but certainly he had to feel silent. God sometimes backs away just far enough to cause us to lean into him all the more. He backs away because he's calling us to come deeper. He backs away so that we will come closer and walk with him. I can't think of a better way to illustrate this than when my daughter, my third daughter, she's, she's, she's a sweet as can possibly be, but she's, she's scared of everything. Still, today, she's, she has a high, uh, high bar for, for how much fear is in her life. And I would have her jump, stand on a stair to jump to me. And it was so cute. And she would stand on this chair, 18 months old. She'd stand on this chair, stand on the stair, whatever. And I'd say, I want you to jump to me. And her, she'd stand there on the edge of the chair. And her little arms would start going back and forth really fast, like she was going to do it. And her feet would even move, right? And she'd get really excited. I'd say, come on, jump, 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 jump. And she wouldn't move. I was thinking maybe things have changed now that she's three years old. I put her on a stair just a couple days ago, knowing I would use this as an illustration. I put her on the stair. She stands there. I say, okay, babe, jump to me. Guess what she did? 
the same thing she did 18 months ago. She's just waving her little arms like, oh, dad, there you go. oh, dad, okay, okay. And I'm like, jump to me. She's like, dad, you got to come closer. So what I would do is I would not move my hands, but just move my body just a little bit. And she'd say, okay, okay, okay. And all that pent up energy. And she'd finally just pff, lean forward. It was not a jump. <laughs> At times... God backs away because he wants us to lean in. His silence is so that we will seek him all the more. He longs for us to trust him. He's never absent. He may not actually move his hands closer, but what he's calling for you to do is to trust him more and to see every opportunity of his silence or his discipline or your circumstances changing or the loss you're experiencing as an opportunity for you to press in and to put your little head on his chest and hear his heartbeat of love. Perhaps God hasn't moved away from you, but perhaps you have drifted. Perhaps you need to be reminded once again that he's good and that he's loving even in the midst of his discipline. Perhaps you're the one who's lived in fear of leaning in when he said, man, if you'll just lean in, if you'll just trust me, I have something greater than you could ever imagine. Sometimes he backs away to cause us to lean in and sometimes we back away. So my call to action is this. When you cannot hear the voice of God, you must trust his heart. You may not always hear him clearly, but you can always trust him completely. No matter the season of silence that you find yourself in, I want you to hold on to the truth that God's power is at work. He's quietly stirring in the scions of your soul. He's rolling in the undercurrents of your life. He's preparing great things for his glory and for your good. And his power will unleash in your life. But you have to trust. Someone once told me that the sign of a best friend is being able to sit in silence with that person and it not be awkward. God's sometimes that way with us. He calls us to be close, to have a deep relationship. And so at times, I think he sits in silence, hoping that you won't think it's awkward and calling you to come close. So my friend, remember that while God may be quiet, he is never absent. Trust him, trust him, trust him. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for giving us more than we could ever ask or imagine through your son, Christ. We thank you that even in the broken places of our heart, you meet us. And there you help us harvest more of your goodness and love. Even knowledge of how you work in silence is good. So I thank you for that. And I thank you for your word teaching us that. Will you help us be people that no matter what comes, we say we are with you and we trust you. God, where we're disobedient and must turn around and repent, will you correct us and help us live in righteousness, a holy life that is pleasing to you. God, thank you for answering these prayers, not based on any power of our own, but on the power of the Holy Spirit that is in our life through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's in his perfect and powerful name, I pray. Amen.